Hello, and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. Your Dark Materialists are myself, Alaric, Joanna, and Travis. We are diving deep into the Golden Compass, and we're going to continue to read it this week with you guys. Uh, And we're going to dive in with Joanna's recap. All right, guys. So part two opens with Egyptians heading north to Trollesund, the main port of Lapland, where the witches have a consulate. Farder Coram has a history with the witches and knows that they must gain the witches' favor if they are to successfully rescue the children. Once docked, Lyra and Farder Coram visit the consul, a man named Dr. Martin Lancelius. Farder Coram asks Lancelius for help locating a witch named Serafina Pecola and explains why they're there. Dr. Dr. Lancelius shares that there is an organization in town called the Northern Progress Exploration Company, which pretends to be mining for minerals but is really importing children, and suggests obtaining the services of an armored bear named Yorick Bernson. Dr. Lancelius is interested in Lyra and the alethiometer, and he tests her to see if she can find something belonging to Serafina Pecola. While she is preoccupied outside, Lancelius tells Farder Coram that Lyra has a major part to play in the destiny of their world, but that she must remain ignorant of the task in order to fulfill it. Farder Coram and Lyra leave the consul's house and find John Fa, who tells him that he has hired an aeronaut from Texas named Lee Scoresby, who owns a balloon. Later, Lyra and Farder Coram go to enlist the help of Yorick Bernison, whose price for service is recovering the armor that was stolen from him by the townspeople. Back on the ship, as the Egyptians discuss their plans, Lyra wakes from a dreamy sleep and gazes at the aurora in the northern sky. To her surprise, the image of a city begins to form, but the vision is interrupted by the arrival of Serafina Pecola's goose demon, Keza. Keza tells him that the children are being taken to Bolvanger, a secret compound guarded by a company of northern Tartars. While John Fa and Farder Coram talk to the town governor about securing Yorick's armor, Lee Scoresby provides the distraction Lyra needs to steal away and tell Yorick Bernison where to find it. With his armor fully restored, Yorick Bernison joins the expedition north to Bolvanger, and a sleepy pantalaman decides to wait until morning to tell Lyra about the monkey-like shadow following them in the pine trees. So I kind of want to start with Travis because last week he was the outlier, not, not really feeling it. So, uh, how'd you feel about these two? Big armor bear fighting. (laughs) That's all you needed. You're like, okay, on board. I I was sold. I was sold that and the goose. Well, the, you know, I, I, there's a lot of demon stuff in here that we're probably we're going to dive into a lot of demon stuff. But I, I thought the um, maybe one of the most interesting demon elements in these two chapters was the uh, the witch's ability to separate from their demons at great distance. And this uh, pair of chapters also uh, clearly shows the challenges or the limits to which a normal human and a demon can separate themselves. Pan sort of pulls himself as far as possible away from Lyra. And we realize how upsetting it is. And the, uh, the witches can separate themselves great distances because, uh, Keza seems to be sort of traveling at will. So I kind of saw that almost like as an astral projection kind of thing that the witches did. What do you think? I could see that, you know, being able to, push yourself so far and and see things and travel and move around. Yeah, I could totally see that, especially if it's an extension of your consciousness. Yeah, I guess. So. I, I don't know. I kind of feel like they have these other special things they can do um, that because of how they are, how they're one with themselves and one with nature, that they're able to actually have it be like they've worked the distance out over time. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Like they've, they've like, it's like stretching or yoga. It's like an exercise. They're not just born with it. You don't think? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, can you, are you born a witch or can you be a witch? That's I don't a good know. Question. We, right. So if they're born a witch, then maybe it's just like with Lyra or something that's inside, but, um, I don't, I don't know. Well, um, the witches are, are, I've been excited to get to the witches because, 
you know, we're starting to get into more, more and more fantasy elements are being are layered and we're getting a couple really big ones here. The witch's council. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny that the town, what is, do you remember the name of the town that the land, did you mention it, Joanna? The name I of did. The, I think it's Charleston. Yeah. So they land there and it feels like, um, a level in a RP, like a Skyrim level. Because there's like quest elements, they have to go and talk to someone. Um, there are sort of like hidden things they have to find. They have to like pass information on to someone. It felt very. Uh, there was a, a quality to these two chapters which was uh, a little workmanlike, and I don't mean to say that as a bad thing, but they a lot of things needed to happen here, and we were introduced to so many integral characters to this to this story um Yurik, of course lee scoresby is a huge character um you know the witches in general are very important to the overarching story um so i, I was uh, i was really swept up in the fantasy elements of these two chapters so i, I yeah i agree alaric i mean I, you know to, to kind of back myself up here um you know when in the very beginning when we look at uh, chapter 10 um, and he starts to talk about the witches, which is I, I'm sort of I'm fascinated by the witches, um, you know. And we just said uh, this idea of whether or not they are are you born a witch or is it something you can become and practice. Um, but I love the fact that you know, even time. They, Father Cordum says that it's, it, it's nothing to a witch. Like how how far back he goes with the witches was like forty years, but that time is nothing to a witch. Um, and so that that kind of element, I know you were talking about the the level and things, but I, I'm still sort of stuck on on these witches. And when we were talking about the demon, something that was so interesting, because of how far away the demon could be, when Fartacorum is telling his story about how he had helped a witch and he said he couldn't see the demon, people were shocked. And they it was almost like they said she didn't have a head. And and then there started there's all this like, well, do, witches don't even have demons. And I just love the fact that witches are still such a mysterious element. There's like folk, you know, like like rumors about them and they don't know. You know, No, of course they have them, but they're able to, you know, have them go much greater distances. And so that, I think that's why I feel that they could have been nurturing and fostering this distance um, over time. Yeah, I, I could I could separately definitely see that, and I would be on board with that. And going back to what you're talking about that conversation, and when Farter Coram was telling this tale of himself saving Serafina's life, um, there's a real disbelief to it too. People are like, "Oh, then that's not possible," and like people get the willies. And one guy I think even says, "Oh no, you must have been wrong. Maybe it was an invisible demon or something, or they could make their demons invisible." They were more willing to believe that a demon could be invisible than not be present. Right. Yeah, I think that was John Fa. Was it John Fa that said that? I think so. Additional, um, additional piece of interesting information that continue, continuing to build this this demon uh, lore was the um, conversation about demons settling and what that meant and when it happened and how long how long uh, or what at what point in someone's life that might happen and why um, and the pairing of a demon with a person doesn't always work out so well um, the story which might be my quote for the end of this episode about the man whose uh, demon chose chose a dolphin and he was stuck on the water his whole life. Not necessarily. I mean, he was a great, um, seaman, but he was trapped in some ways until he died and was buried at sea. Uh, that was oddly tragic, but also an interesting, like, you know, they don't, they're not going to have that same comfort that the demons that we've met, um, like, you know, land dwelling demons or even bird demons. Those are more, there's a comfort element with a demon being able to be by your side, but you know, the dolphins in the water, like you can't be next to a dolphin that much. Yeah. I, I, something I found that was so fascinating. This is probably one of my favorite parts in the, in the two, in the two sections that we read. Um, but this idea that Lyra is, she's afraid of what if Pan picks something she doesn't like. And so it don't, I was like, Oh, the demon picks. 
And I was just like, wow, like that, what a, what a cool thing. Like the demon gets to pick. And, and you know, I, I feel like the human must have the upper hand in so many other things as far as how, you know, how their relationship goes and how their life sort of plays out. And the demon gets to pick its, its form. And I can't remember the name of the, of the sailor. Is it, it's not Jerry. What is it? But he says, she says, well, what if they pick one that you don't like? And he said, well, you're going to be discontented because what happened is then you're unhappy with who you are and you have to learn to love who you are. I, and I found that so amazingly fascinating. I did too. I really like, I even wrote down discontent. That was one of my notes here. Um, and, you know, it goes back to some of the other discussions we've had in earlier episodes about what it meant if your demon settled on a, a dog or a canine. Um, you know, that meant that maybe the demon knew something you didn't know. Is that possible that they sort of are one step ahead of you on sort of what you're sort of meant to be or what what your calling is? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I was thinking, you know, I, I guess when we looked at the demon servants and it was funny because it taught one of my favorite little images, it talks about the maid servant, um, at later on. And it says her clucking hen. Ch yeah. Chicken. That's <laughs> her, great. Like, clucking yeah, it's hen. like freaking out. And it was <laughs> freaking out and it cracked me up. But then I thought, well, she's a servant. She's not a dog. So there's something that, you know, so, so that woman still was a servant. Mm -hmm. Her demon settled on a clucking hen. And that's a kind of exactly how she is. So I, I did, I found that to be a really interesting, um, some people, I think the line is like, some people want a lion and they end up with, you know, like a mouse and they have to learn to deal with that. Right. We see another snake demon this time, but the, the human or the witch, I guess, is not quite as untrustworthy as maybe I would have thought when I first saw that he had a snake demon, but he was cunning and he was, uh, wise and his, Interaction with Lyra is actually pretty fascinating because she sees a, some communication. She, she sees his snake reacting. His demon is reacting to what is going on between Farter Quorum and what Farter Quorum is saying because Farter Quorum doesn't really want to let on that she can read the alethiometer. And she reads the room better than even Farter Quorum can right. um, and sort of snaps to action uh, and sort of admits that she can, and she's also proud of being able to read it too. So it could be a little bit of both, but she opens up a little bit after seeing those cues. I wonder if the alethiometer itself is, um, actually helping Lyra see, uh, the real world a little bit better because she's learning to interpret all of that, uh, symbology on the alethiometer. Maybe it's helping her to pick up, uh, real world cues, especially in, as, as relates to, uh, the demons because the demons are, you know, for one, for all intents and purposes, uh, a symbol representing who each, uh, individual person is. Mm -hmm. She is asked to perform two tasks with the alethiometer to sort of show what she can do. Um, the first one is to sort of tell him what is going on with um, the Tartars and a possible, like what they're up to and that they're going, I think she interprets that they're going to do a fake attack on this place. Um, and that's what she interprets. And it, and it comes out that she believed that he already knew the answer to that, which is why she asked. And even the second one she asked, she, he also knows the answer. He wants his, he wants her to prove that he can do it by answering things he already knows the answer to, which is which is kind of interesting. But going out to uh, see which um, piece of uh, cloud was it? Cloud. Cloud pine. Cloud pine, um, which is pretty awesome. I like that name. Um, cloud pine was Serafina's, um, and she goes right out and does it, and she can find it right away. Uh, she uses the alethiometer quite a bit here and with relative ease. She's getting it. I mean, she uses it to find uh, Yorick's armor with almost no difficulty at all. Five, like five minutes. Yeah. After they walk, she's like doing I, it as I was reading it. I felt like she was doing it even as she was just leaving their initial meeting. Like she's just like walking down the cobblestone, icy streets, reading this thing. 
and being able to like do other things while she's, she's be, it's really becoming second nature to her in such a short period of time. But after she demonstrates it the second time and she runs out to grab the, the piece of, of uh, pine, it's revealed. And we've mentioned this before that this is a child that has been spoken of for hundreds of years. And they, and he even says, I was hoping I'd be alive to see, to see her. What is she? She's the chosen one. She's the chosen one. She's a chosen I know. One. I'm sorry, Joanna. I know. <laughs> were you done? Were you bummed out when you read that? Or was it like, it, it's, it's, it's so well woven in or it's kind of like, ugh, again. No, I mean, it, it's, I, this story is so just masterfully done. I cannot begrudge a chosen one. Um, but I just, I just, you know, this idea that, that she has this task to fulfill and is not, you know, she's not aware of it and others are. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, I think it depends on how it plays out in the rest of the story and how, you know, how they use, how they use her and who she is to fulfill whatever task it is that she needs to do. Um, so maybe I'll have a little bit more enthusiasm for it. Like, yes, she was the only one that could have done that it, versus it's like, Neville. It's, I like that. Yeah. Versus Neville. She, <laughs> I like that she, you know, she's going to be left no, there. No one's going to interfere. Even the people that are aware of her and what her role is and that she's basically tasked with saving everyone, which is a big, you know, and they can't help her. They can't tell her she's on a quest. They can't tell her anything. And she has to be allowed to make mistakes and fail and make her own choices. And I think he says something like, uh, I, I'm, I'm hope I'm hoping that she makes the right choices, but he can't tell her anything. He gives her, you, you, I sort of thought when he broke off the little piece of pine for her that he is like, what can I do to help her without helping her? And he thought, what could I give her without sort of outwardly helping that she might be able to use in the future that'll be helpful? And he mm-hmm. gave her this small token that I, you know, maybe will come in. I don't know if it'll come into play or not, but could come right. into play. I, you know, the whole chosen one thing, the um, the only thing that disappoints me about it um, a little, and maybe it's not, maybe I should just be willing to let the let it play out, is um, that we don't know what she's chosen for. Agreed. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, right now we have no idea that she has any kind of larger mission than to rescue the kids and to free your dad. But beyond that, I mean, she's chosen for what? Oh, are they in, find out in other heroes journey literature that you could think of? I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Can you think of other versions of a chosen one that they, they have no idea that they're a chosen one? No one talks about it. They have to be they have to complete. People are aware of that person being chosen, but no one talks about it. No one talks to them about it. Harry Potter, that's all they do is talk about it. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like every single person knows that he's special and tells him he's special. And he, it, he resists it because he's like, I'm just, a you know, he, he, he resists it. But ultimately, he is the chosen one. Um, are there other versions where the chosen one is completely unaware of it? I can't think of anything. I, I, I just thought of a, of a couple of other chosen ones off the top of my head. And, you know, my, my first choice was uh, Anakin Skywalker and sweet sassy Molassi. They call him the chosen one every five minutes, yep. you know? Um, and then, you know, Paul and Dune, that's his whole shtick. Yeah. From the beginning, you know, and then you could even like jump further back uh, to um, Frodo in Lord of the Rings. That's, I mean, we, we get his whole mission statement. Um, in Rivendell, you know, he, yep. he's chosen to, to take this ring. He's going to drop it off. That's he accepts, it. He accepts it. He accepts it. That's, that's his it. burden. Yep. Yep. Even, even Neo in the matrix, mm-hmm. he's resistant to it, but he starts to believe it, you know? So there's, and everyone tells him that he is, or very early on, mm-hmm. um, except for the Oracle, which I guess is the twist, right? Is that she says, Oh, you're not the, you're not the one. Yeah. Um, but 
Yeah, it, it, it could be unique. And I, I'm curious to see where it goes, considering that she's her mission or what she believes her mission is, is to find Roger. I mean, if, if you want to boil it down to the smallest version of what she wants to do, she'd like to get Roger. And I would assume without reading too much into it, go back to Jordan. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe that would be it. Go to the north. She's going to have her adventure. She's going to get her friend back and she's going to rescue these children in the process. And then she's done. Or maybe maybe end up by her her father's side, possibly. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's. It, it, it I would assume that she's something bigger is beyond besides just rescuing children. I mean, I guess we do get some inclination of uh, what what her her overall mission is when she uh, when we she starts to talk about um, you know the the parallel worlds when the the goose's descriptions of the parallel worlds and uh, she's clearly someone who's supposed to uh, build this bridge between uh, their world and the other worlds so you know. I guess as we have we have an idea of what her uh, greater mission is supposed to be. She sees a city in the sky. She sees it. She goes into a sort of semi alethiometer trance and sees the city in the sky, which we don't know what it is or whether it's real, but she sees it and describes so much of it. It's not like, oh, I see a faint outline of no, no, she's describing spires and and buildings and streets. She sees so much of it that, you know, I would, if, if, if I stopped reading this book right now and I did not pick it up and didn't finish it, I was fed up with it. Um, I would believe that there are many other worlds and this bridge to another world was possible and that the witches know about it and have been aware about it, aware of it for a long time. And that where the witches choose to settle are in the thin membranes between worlds. Uh, and they hear echoes from other worlds. We've already gotten that all, all within the first half of this book, even without real confirmation that it's, that it's happening. Uh, and, and does anyone else is, was that unique to Lyra seeing the city in the sky at that moment? Could anyone else have looked up and seen it? Because she does kind of go into a trance. She does, but I, 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 I love the description of that part in the book. It's just, it's a gorgeous description, um, and the words that that Pullman uses, you know, as if it's from, as if it's from heaven itself. Um, you know, these ha- the edge had a profound and fiery crimson, like the fires of hell. It says she was moved by it. It was so beautiful. It was almost holy. Like I feel like. That's not just something you would have looked up in the sky and, and saw. She was, I think, the, it, it was almost like the lights because she became mesmerized, almost like with the alethiometer. She becomes mesmerized by the pinks and the greens and and the reds, and she, you know, she kind of gets drawn into that, and then it presents itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe I don't know. Did it, you know she did it present itself, or did she, you know, she was able to make whatever connection to be able to see it and is so moved by it. She's like moved to tears. Mm-hmm. It's like she's moved to tears by it. Um, but I think what's so interesting then is that once she sees it and once they start talking to the goose, she starts having this again, just like when she found out that Coulter was her mother and Azra was her father. And it was like, we're going to go and they're going to, we're going to have this life. And she starts imagining this whole thing where she and Azrael are going to start to like find bridges and go visit and, and, you know, and explore all these places. Like it's almost like as soon as she even has a taste of something, she completely own like takes it and like owns it. And, um, it sort of feels like she has a, a right to. So she has an adventurous spirit and, and you know, yes, yeah, she, she doesn't do anything half ass. She goes, she goes full ass um, <laughs> on everything. Uh, she's, she doesn't really mess around. It's, it's impressive for a, you know, it, it, what is she again? 11, 12 years old. She's just so confident. Um, and, you know, we could talk further about her confidence in how she deals with Yurik. Um, Travis, do you want to talk about Yurik a little bit? I think I, I just I love him. 
I do. Um, it's kind of fun. Um, I, I've been listening to uh, the audiobooks in addition to uh, reading along, and the voice actor they have for uh, Yorick is pretty incredible. Mm. He, he's got this really low rumble, and you can almost like feel his voice in your chest, you know? And um, that's 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 how I try to to, to read it when I'm uh, reading on my own. And um, I mean, my voice doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, in my head, you know, that's what I feel. But um, his story is just so far. In any case, it's just so tragic. It is. I mean, Agreed. he 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 was tricked with with alcohol. And he reminds it reminds me of you know stories of Native Americans and how you know settlers came out and you know plied the uh, the natives with uh, with alcohol and things along those lines and and tricked them into taking bad deals and uh, that that that's what happened to Yurik you know he was he was tricked into taking a, a bad deal we don't know what happened what what happened to him before. You know, he's uh, he encountered the the people. But, um, you know, I get the sense that uh, he he's he's noble, that there's a, a very deep nobility to him when, um, you know, Lyra offers him the deal and he says he's going to take it. I, you know, I feel right away that the, he's he's going to take it right until you know, his last breath. You know, he is going to be by Lyra's side until his last breath. She would she's going to be restoring his soul because his armor to to him is his demon. That yeah. Is oh, his, gosh. Yeah. The the bit when he gets the armor armor back and he's treating the armor with the with the seal blubber. Yeah. And he's like making it basically bringing it back to life. You know, and, and she says that he's he he cares for the armor like he cares for 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 like she cares for Pan mm -hmm. and that and, and what's actually needed here is where we get our verification. The demon is the soul because she says, you know, he cares for his armor like she cares for Pan. The armor is his soul. There you go. There's the pairing. Yep. You know, they when we first see him. He is as animal as he could be. Mm -hmm. he, he's 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 filthy. He's described here. Um, Lyra had an impression of a blood-stained muzzle and face, small malevolent black eyes, and an immensity of dirty, matted, yellowish fur. Ugh. Mm -hmm. And you know he. He stands on his hind legs and he's ten feet tall. He's massive and 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 terrifying. And both she and Farter Corum stand their ground. Pan is a little bit. He's losing it a little bit. Um, but they sort of are. She Lyra's stunned and impressed by him. Um, and Farter Corum seems to have. Uh, he knows enough about what Panzerbjorn are that they can be spoken to and reasoned with. Um, but Lyra, you know, Lee basically distracts everyone. So Lyra can go and hire him, which I didn't even remember that part from reading it initially is he's like, starts dealing a deck of cards. And then Hester, his demon is like, Hey, you want to go get that bear? Now's your chance. And she, I mean, immediately bolts. It's like she doesn't, she doesn't like, oh, what's going on? Who's this bunny rabbit? Blah, blah, blah. She's like out, she bolts and goes and gets him right away. She's a doer. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Big time. A doer. Oh, yeah. yes. Um, I think Yorick, one of the things um, that is just interesting to me, I'm trying to figure out is when he broke with, the other bears like we know he's on his own um later on in in um chapter 11 we we understand that all of the other panzerborn are are fighting with the bad guys mm -hmm. pretty much and i'm i'm curious if you know is that when is when they were recruited when he made his split like 
Do, do you know what I mean? I'm, I, I don't know that they say that. And maybe I missed it. So I don't know if they said in there when he made a split. But I'm wondering if that was the, you know, that was the impetus for him to say, like, I'm not doing this. And then, you know, he's on his own now to be available to Lyra and company. Yeah, I'm trying to I, I was sort of trying to figure out how long he had been where he is. Had it been relatively recent? It, it felt like it's there's some it's been some time. Mm-hmm. Um because he's sort of fallen into disrepair in some ways. He's sort of um, living in filth and he's an alcoholic and uh, he's broken in some ways. Uh, and, and also accepting of his fate in a, in a sad way. He's like, well, this is, this is who I am now. Um, it takes some outsiders to sort of snap him out of it. He's kind of, he is kind of accepting of it until they come in back, they come into his life. I well, wonder if the, um, the fact that the Oblation Board helped the uh, current king of the Panzerbjorn uh, get get his seat. Uh, there was no collusion, by the way. Um, <laughs> totally if, generation. Exactly. I wonder if uh, that's the reason that he's – that's part of the reason that he's gone. I mean, is he the heir to the Panzerbjorn you know, leadership? Somehow, is did is he disgusted by the way that the Panzerbjorn, the new leader, got his uh, got his seat? Yeah, it's led on that the new leader of the Pan- Panzerbjorn is going to ma- be making significant changes to their society, um, but nothing is is really hinted at beyond that. So there's a changing of the guard has taken place relatively recently. And it could have been linked to what they are up to with the Oblation Board. So that maybe maybe Yurik hasn't been in this station for that long. Maybe it, it is a relatively recent. Or or it's recent relatively recent, but he fell into it uh, deep. He went deep. He fell hard. He yeah. fell he fell really hard, especially losing his armor. He, you know, he, he goes, you know, it could have been he sh- shows up in town, they get him drunk, they take his, I mean, like, night number one, mm-hmm. and they, they take his armor, and he's like, well, I have less worth now. This is, I'm just, I don't, I'm not going anywhere without it. I don't know where it is. You know, you, you could think he could just ransack the whole town and try to find it, but he's depressed. There's some mm-hmm. amount of depression here. Do... The Panzerbjorn, have, have we discussed at any point that they have a reputation for um, metal work and being a, beyond the armor and uh, being able to um, I don't know, fix things? Because, you know, they, they, the, 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 the townspeople decided really fast that, hey, we've got this bear. Mm-hmm. You know, let's get him to start uh, – doing repairs and let's trick him into being as Lyra says a slave, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so was that part of the initial plan that once they, once they saw him come into town and they, and he was in the state that he was in, they thought, you know, here's, here's some Panzerbjorn labor that, uh, we can, we can hold on to. Oh yeah. I mean, and, and he's, you know, what she's like, what do you do here? He's like, well, I, I fix these things. I, I, and I, what, I think another thing, he, he lifts heavy things. Mm-hmm. It's like so just kind of depressing. It is so, so sad. It is. It is so sad. And, and, you know, the way he, when she approaches him the first time and she's like, Hey, we have this thing through. He's like, I've got a job. And they're like, well, what is it? He's like paid work. Like he's just kind of, he's resigned himself to being in this place and I don't know if it's something about Lyra and her persistence because she always, you know, even if the, if she was a little wary of of Yorick, she oh, you know, she kind of gets her little claw in there, and she kind of presses him. She presses him in the first meeting, and she presses him in the second meeting. But she gets him in the first meeting to actually consider breaking what was a vow. You know, mm-hmm. they're known for their loyalty. They're known mm-hmm. for that, um, which is why he's like, oh, you know, I'm going to, I, I have this job. But um, something about her has him say, you know what, this would be my price. This is what it would take for me to leave here. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, he, had, he had, there's, there's something that could draw him away. Yeah. And the fact that he told them that as though there was a chance they could get it was fast. Like, <laughs> 
was fascinating to me. Like, how were these two strangers? That was like get his. It? It's like his moonshot. He's like, well, I'm a bear of my word. I would never go against my word, but. There is one thing that I would ditch for. It's impossible, but I'm going to throw it out here to this little girl and this old man. Ha, ha, ha. Glug, 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 glug. You know, it's mm. like there's no way. Right. But little did he know that, you know, he had a symbol reader, you know, in his presence who was going to be able to find it literally as she walked away from him five minutes later. Right. Well, I mean, it wasn't even that, that well hidden, honestly. Let's let's can we talk about how poorly hidden it was? I, know, right? I would have immediately, <laughs> I, I would have immediately gone to the church and gone to the basement. Number one. Uh, I love how she goes like all um, John Connor and Terminator on him. She's like, "Don't kill anyone. Yes. Please don't yes. kill anyone." And so you he know? just he just kneecaps everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just had the guy's head in his mouth, and she's like, this close. <laughs> exactly. And then I just love though. Um, after he drops him, okay, his head's – the guy's head is bloody. He's like pale Action, and shaking. Yeah. And his demon comes over to console him, you know? Yes. And it just – you know, more reinforcement. No one in this world could possibly ever be lonely, mm-hmm. you know? Because I mean, that's that's years of therapy for us. You know, I was just my head was in a bear's mouth and it was about to, to squish my brain. And, uh, you know, I'm not good with that. But he's just there like his demon comes to console him and calm him and uh, kind of, you know, get him back to equilibrium. You know, Pan has um, been taking the form of an ermine a lot, like sort of like a ferret sort of mm-hmm. thing. And. Lyra's literally wearing him as a scarf in the cold. Yep. Yep. And that that's the amount of like togetherness and closeness and, you know, their heart, they also mentioned in this, uh, the end of the last chapter that their hearts beat simultaneously, you know, their hearts were in rhythm together, <laughs> which I was like, Oh man, there's a, there's a lot of connection here. It, it just makes me wonder, like, as I read this, I'm like, uh, as, as I, as I read this, I, I get very, um, I, I wonder how we're even able to function without them. You know, <laughs> how how is it that we're not able to that we're able to function at all? Because it, it just seems like these guys just have this whole balance that works. You know, it's neat. It's really yeah, the, neat. We so as as humans without demons, we have an internal monologue. I would. I mean, I'm not the only one, right? We have an internal <laughs> right. monologue that's sort of co- going on constantly. But right. we don't have a physical accompaniment with that internal monologue, mm-hmm. which I feel like would be quite comforting if the in, internal monologue was a little critter. Like my my um, lemur could sit here and literally talk to me uh, with my own internal monologue and comfort me when I was scared or sad or or injured. Right. Um, yeah. It's there. You know, our internal monologues can't comfort us in the same way that a, f- a physical being can. You know, while we're talking a little bit about the physical manifestation of our demons, uh, I do need to, uh, you know, make a uh, come out to the the, the audience. Uh, I don't think the guinea pig actually is going to be my my demon after all. Um, there is an animal that I would just found out about this week called a pangolin, and um, yes, it's it's pretty amazing. It looks like, you know, what if uh, an armadillo was, uh, you know, Igor from uh, Frankenstein? (laughs) And um, I I demand that the universe provide one to me because (laughs) it's the most incredible looking animal I've ever seen. And I am desperate to have one accompany me everywhere I go. It's like slightly on its hind legs. And it sort of has its front hands kind of together or close together, like it's about to tell you something all the time. Right. Every every time it's there, it, it's got something like that. It's that it's hesitating to tell you. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. It doesn't have that soft look to it that could be comforting, but I do like the 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 companionship of an animal like that would be pretty terrific. Absolutely. So good. So fully changed. Change the hashtag. You're yep. you're on. Yeah. Hashtag pangolin. Pangolin. Pangolin for demon. <laughs> um, the Lee Scoresby is is introduced. Lee, we, we haven't seen him a lot, but his description. Now I'm I'm a Lin Manuel. I love Lin Manuel. 
I, I don't know Hamilton at all. I've never heard it, never seen it. But I like him. And, but I was kind of a little off of the casting a little bit. Then I read the description and I was like, OK, that's basically Lin, well, Lin, Lin Manuel Miranda. The 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 little must the dark mustache that he maybe he's a little younger than you know maybe what I was picturing so I'm kind of getting back on the Lynn train for now. Um, it it could work for me. I'm having a tough time with it. Yeah, I mean, I I don't have a lot of loyalty to the uh, to the movie at all. Like except at all. for that. Except for but that. My God, Sam Elliott. He's perfect. Exactly. He's he is perfect. perfect. No, he's yes. he. That's that's what I have to break yeah. from. And when I'm reading this, is like, okay, well, that's not a description of Sam Elliott. That's Sam Elliott has a, a, a lustrous gray mustache. Right. Um. And, and Hester, you know, this sort of uh, wily, you know, jackrabbit. You know, that the combination of the two of them just make me so happy. And Kathy Bates was the perfect voice for Hester. Mm-hmm. So I'm 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 still intrigued about how they're going to pull that off. Um, and, and, and sort of to talk about what we've been talking about in the past too, Hester speaks and we hear her speak. And that's another demon that actually talks that we get to hear talk. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's a, there's a small number. The number is quite small of mm-hmm. demons that we're, we're hearing a lot. And I think Hester's going to be one that we're going to hear yammering on quite a bit. I mean, here's my thing for, um, for Lee Scoresby. The description, the physical description is not what matters to me. Uh, I married a Texan, right? I mean, it's like he's from his own country. He's, I just love the fact that the this, like, Brit is like writing about a, the most American thing, which is like Texas. Mm-hmm. And I love watching, you know, and he, he gets it. Like he, he, you know, he gets the swagger. He gets these things. And so like Sam Elliott really did embody those things. Mm-hmm. Um so I think for me, it's going to be more of those mannerisms and it's going to be, you know, cause if he's, if, if he's faking, you know, this terrible drawl, it's going to kill, he, he you know, can't do, he can't do that. Right. He can't do it. No. Because so that like, would be terrible. Right. Like Mary Poppins and Cockney accents. Ouch. Okay. The only, the only, you know, thing that, that saves that it's only saving grace is Dick Van Dyke. You know, he's following in the footsteps of Dick Van Dyke, and that's in that horrendous <laughs> it was accent. So, it was so bad. <laughs> it was it was like it felt deliberate. You know, it was like, okay, we'll cast another yeah. American and we'll do the same thing, and and it's sort of a callback yeah. in a way. Yeah. Right. Um, but you know, the the fact that it's a fantasy novel and it's not our Texas, it is a different Texas. You know, you could play it a little differently. You know, yeah. he, it, Lynn's a New Yorker, right? I mean, he's, you know, he's not a Texan. You know, I married a Texan, too, um, although she doesn't look anything like, uh, you know, uh, uh, p- sadly for me, doesn't look anything like uh, Sam Elliott, because, <laughs> I mean, come on, Sam Elliott is a masterpiece. He's a chef's kiss kind of human being. That's all that mustache. Just, mm, I'm not a mustache guy, but that must I mean, lustrous is is not even it's not even enough praise for what he wears on the top of it. And when he doesn't have it. He, you know what? I can't even look at him. I know it. I know it. I've it's like looking at a naked it. mole rat. It's like looking at a naked mole rat. <laughs> it's hard. I, I can't. He needs to be there. It's rare. Yeah. But he does. He does have. There's some roles where he doesn't have it. Mm-hmm. Wow. Agreed. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, he's wonderful. Um, I think so, his mustache is his demon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. I would buy that. I would buy that. There was a kids in the hall sketch from a bazillion years ago where uh, this guy's be- he grew a beard and the beard was basically like talking to him. And he was like obsessed with his beard. His beard was starting to control his life in like a real like really manifested itself as a personality. So, yeah, I could go along with that. I used to work with a guy who had a Facebook profile for his beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like now I need to grow, I need to grow mine, and you're just looking real good, Travis. I appreciate that. I just yeah. went to the barber shop the other day. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> how's how's mine, Alaric? Is mine? Oh, no. Um, you know, it's, it's <laughs> a little, you're little gonna, patchy. A little, little patchy. more work. A little more work. Yeah. Yikes. Give it some. Give it time. Give it time. All right. I'll try. Um. Wow. We we went way off the the reservation. <laughs> um. So uh was so I wanted to sort of talk a little bit more about Serafina and her relationship with Farter Quorum. His subtle reaction to her that that Lyra picks up on 
is that there's more to the story. Um, and I really, I latched onto that. L- Lyra did too, although she moves on pretty quickly, but I sort of sat in that moment a little bit thinking that there must, something else happened between the two of them. Did you guys pick up on that? Oh, I absolutely just, you know, he just gets that softer look in his eye, that far away look in his eye, that sad kind of sad look in his eye. And I Loss. thought, yes, I've been mm. there. I've been there farther Gorham. Yeah. I totally was picking that up. There's some warmth there and it's the first question he asks. Um, not only because he mentions that, that she owes him, you know, he sort of says that, you know, she owed a debt to him, but she already had repaid it in the past. Right. right? Multiple times, multiple times multiple, over and over. Yes. There's more to this. It's not some debt. It's there's a, there's a relationship here. They, they know capital K each other. Oh, there's an Aragorn Arwen situation going oh, on here. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Farter Quorum's such a, I mean, such a, there's, he's such a lovely character that I just, I just want him to be happy. And mm-hmm. the fact that he's, there's some piece of him that's lost is sad. And I don't know how this is going to end up. Spoilers. I do know how it ends up. Um, the, it's, you know, I, I, I want her to come back into the scene now, like now, now I want her to be back and I want them to see each other now. But I, mm-hmm. I feel like maybe that's part of why he's sad. Do you know, like in the beginning of that chapter, when they're talking about witches and said, it's been, Oh, I don't know, 40 years. He's like, that's nothing to a witch. And so, you know, that he knows it's a lot to him. Yes. So that feels to me like he's, yeah, Yeah. he's moved on in age and she may still be this beautiful young thing from 40 years ago or 140 years ago. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like that loss is, yeah, I feel like that might be where it's coming from as well. There's a there's a graphic novel. I, re- I read the graphic novel of the Golden Compass um, in preparation for this as well. It's a very easy read. Uh, but the the Farder Quorum and Serafina story is is uh, it's it's quite good. Um, the overall the art is a little is missing a little something, but I really liked how that was told and how Farder Quorum and and his age and how different. Um, I thought that that was done quite well. Um, so I, mild recommendation for the graphic novel. Just mild, huh? Mild. The art is not particularly good. And mm. the, the, the way that it is edited down for a graphic novel um, cuts out some significant stuff. It, it feels a little bit more like the screenplay of the movie. It's, it's, it's tightened up in ways that's kind of like, oh, okay, okay. They're, they're trimming and trimming and trimming and trimming. Um, it could have been better. Who I mean, published it? Uh, you know what? I will, I'll, I'll put that in the notes. Um, I'll, I'll pull it out and look at it. Um, but yeah, it, a mild recommendation. If, uh, if either one of you guys want to borrow it, I'll just mail it to you. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we talked about the dolphin um, that, you know, you're, you know, you talk about the the way that their separation causes so much anxiety, even being on a boat with a dolphin swimming next to your boat. It still feels like you'd be right on the edges of that, that heart beating faster distance that you just could not get any closer to your demon would be that felt very tragic to me that his life was like that. But I would assume that it's not an isolated incident. I mean, even for a bird, a demon who is a bird who chooses to be a bird, the distance that they can get from their human is still limits their ability to soar. Um, Pan has shown that Pan is loving being on a boat, loving being on a boat. Uh, I think seagull is uh, mm-hmm. something that he's loving and swimming in the water, I think, as a porpoise at one point. Um, he's really loving that. Uh, but settling is is another story. Like, you know, the bird, you know, they can fly above and see a certain distance, but they can't soar quite as high as a, a normal bird could. Yeah, I, I love the description in the book when um, when he's talking about when they're talking about settling and he's talking about when his demon settled 
Um, and he says, you know, take old Belisaria. She's a seagull. And that means I'm a kind of seagull too. I'm not grand and splendid nor beautiful, but I'm a tough old thing and I can survive anywhere and always find a bit of food and company. That's worth knowing that is. And when your demon settles, you'll know the sort of person you are. And so, yeah, and then he goes on again to say, you know, you might have wanted a lion and you got a poodle and you're going to have to just deal with that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, there's this, I love that, I love that idea that he's like, that's good to know. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, and, and so he was, you know, whether or not he liked the form that the demon took, what that represented about himself, he respected. Mm-hmm. And, so, yeah, so I guess, if yeah, what if you don't respect yourself to begin with, then what happens, you know, like, I'm that must be a really hard transition. And then Lyra thinks that she's never, like, she never wants to settle. She says, I'm never growing up. You know, yep. I, I wrote down, like, the, the Peter Pan, you know, um, that she's like, oh, you know, no, no, that, I'm good. I'm good here. Um, I don't <laughs> need to go past this point. I'm, I'm happy. Right. Um, yeah, she doesn't, she's not ready for that. She doesn't want it. She wants him to be able to continue to change. And he also says, well, you're going to want to grow up like all the other girls. And she was, she's like, nah, oh, nope. She did not like that, the way she that was did phrased. Not. She did not. She was like, no, I do not. I also thought I liked that um, her seasickness was eased quite a bit by Pan's enjoyment of what he was doing. So mm-hmm. when she was getting queasy, she could feel what he was feeling to sort of ease her illness, her, her seasickness. I, I liked that, too. That was nice. Well, and then that draws me into this idea when, of the pain that happened when they went to visit Yorick. And Pan wants to go, and mm-hmm. Lyra's hesitant. Mm-hmm. And Pan makes a very, I don't know, unpan like decision. And he's like, I'm going. And Lyra, and so then they start to stretch. I'm, I'm, I'm like pulling like an imaginary taffy. I don't, I don't know. But it's like, you know, it starts to stretch. Whatever that is, is stretching. And at some point, Lyra's crying and, and, you know, she finally goes to Pan and then they just have this emotional breakdown. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to do it. I thought you were going to, you know, don't ever do that again. And and, yeah, I I thought you really would. No, I couldn't believe how much it hurt. Yeah. And it hurts. It hurts their um, it's, it's sadness and love is what they feel as they're mm-hmm. being pulled further and further apart. This whole sequence of him, he, he really does want to get closer and she's hesitant and that, that chain link fence is this barrier that he's going through and she doesn't, she's stopping and staying put, you know, even with as brave as she is, um, Pan's curiosity is, is pulling him forward. And, you know, it is an equal pain for him. It's not like, oh, she's feeling it because I'm pulling away. They're both feeling that same thing, and yet he's still pushing and pulling. Mm-hmm. I mean, what we have to remember is that Pan's curiosity is her curiosity. Same. Yeah. So, you know, she's being this – is, this is her own mind divided against itself. You know, that, that hurts. I, I, I read that, and I read it as – their manifestation of a panic attack, you know, because sure. the panic attack is that gap between what should be and what is and or what you think should be and what is. And I just felt that and she that that they created a physical manifestation. And I keep using that phrase of the gap between the two between the two and that breakdown, that, that uh, you know, emotional collapse that they have, it's brief, but, uh, you know, it, it's kind of what a panic attack feels like. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was really interesting, really neat. Yeah. Agreed. Um, any other highlights you guys wanted to discuss? Or lowlights? <laughs> I hate Chapter 11. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't hate Chapter 11. I love Chapter 11. <laughs> Not bankruptcy, though. I do like that they give a little history of um, the alethiometer and what it was intended for. And and I do like that they give a little bit of speculation on dust. Um, yes. They're, they're, you know, they, they really don't give you a lot. They, they throw you these little scraps, like, here and there. They keep it shrouded in mystery. 
Um, but I like that when they're talking with the consul, he's explaining like how the alethiometer even came to be, that it's this instrument that was created by, you know, invented by a scholar in Prague, of all places. Of all places. Right. Um, basically like an astronomy tool to try to, to try to use, you know, aligning the planets in the same way that they did, you know, these other things for meaning. Um, oh, they said so astrology, I, like astrology. astrology yeah. 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 Sorry. Astrology. Yes. I said yeah. astronomy. Absolutely. And, and then I also like when they're talking with, um, with the, um, with Kesa and they're talking about dust and they start to get into like a little bit more about, you know, why people are fearful of it or why it's even this thing, because they talk about the fact that they're, that once it, you know, they don't know if, if, if it's coming down, if it's new or if it's like always been there, but at some point people are afraid of it. They feel like when they get it, bad things start to happen. So they're trying to like sep keep separate from dust. I'd have to find the exact quote for you, but well, they just... said, yeah, they said if, if, um, you know, not everyone knows about dust, but when they do find out about dust, it's all consuming. It's all they can think about is dust. I can't find. I can, and I can kind of get that too. It's like a, a, a particle that is, it has that much power. Um, we don't really have that in our, in our science so much. Um, because this, this feels a little more magical. Uh, it would, even just reading this book, it's like, that's number one or two on my list of things that I'm curious and excited about. And I can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. And, and they, and you're right. They say they're, they're afraid of it and they'll do it nothing to discover what it is. And then the, the goose demon calls them the dust hunters, mm -hmm. but York calls them something different when he's talking with, uh, when he's talking with, you know, with Lyra, he, he calls them a different name, uh, which sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. When you read it, you know, whatever a child cutter is, that sounds awful. Um, it's like he knows more, like he knows more than other people know. You know, the the mystery and the lore and the game of telephone that rumor and legend is, um, he seems to be, you know, intercision is something that has been mentioned several times. There, there's a real, there's a violence to that term and child cutter, there's a violence to that term. So we're being... You know, we're peeking behind the curtain a little bit without knowing what's really happening at Balvangar. You know, the the definition of Balvangar is the fields of evil. Yes. I mean, you yes. know, you go up and you ring the doorbell. It's like, and eh, uh, you know what? I'm going to go back the other direction. I know, I know, it's been four days on a sledge, but uh, <laughs> I'm going back to that town and drink. Yeah, I'm sorry. When you see the sign for Bolvanger with the little quote quoted um, translation underneath, "Fields of Evil," you turn around. <laughs> That's you know? a hard pass. <laughs> exactly. It just reminds me of the government signs outside uh, a mile away from Area 51. You know, you don't go past those signs, mm -hmm. but they're going to. They're going to because anyway. that the story has has to move forward. <laughs> and it's such a terrible place. No, no animals survive there like you didn't know I mean like there's no like no birds no plants like it's just this awful concrete barren place that's you know protected by brutal northern tartars mm -hmm. you mean like mordor like mordor, like mordor. Oh, but you know i i'm encouraged that the tartars apparently have not been well trained and they're also uh there's been no combat so there's a chance, right? Our little 107, 170 guys and a giant bear, you know, who's to say they can't uh, pull one out? Yeah, yeah, she says they're out of practice. Yeah. And now they got a bear with one inch thick sky armor. Oh, he, awesome. it, they're shooting at him and he, it's like pew, pew, pew. Like he doesn't seem to be. He, there's one little spot that Lyra sees and she reaches through that armor to calm him down. Uh, which is again another one of those moments, right. Lyra moments. That's what like the heck? she's so kind of dialed in. How do you even find that spot? Like uh, you know, he's literally going to like crush a man's skull in his jaws, and she's just and then she and then I love that part because then she says it says she put her hand through and then Pan jumps up and he becomes like a wildcat to try to mm -hmm. protect her. And she puts her hand in the armor and then in a ferocious voice she says, Yorick. Like, 
she says this, she's like 11 and she mm. commands, she says this ferocious voice. And I thought, where does she, my husband thought I was goofy. Cause I was like, I can't believe she did that. You know, <laughs> the wherewithal to, but you know, just the commanding to command something, you know, that spontaneously is something that's very, you know, it's, a, it's true to her nature and it's who she is. It's, it's a cool thing when she comes out like that. Yeah. Agreed. You know, I, it, it made me think a little bit. The, she has some qualities of a demon herself, right? Like with a lot of uh, the different characters. You know, when she does things like this, when she has those insights about people that uh, no one else would have. Like, I feel like she's got a lot of the same characteristics of uh, of, of a demon, you know? And uh, I, especially in, in regards to Yorick. Mm-hmm. Oh, Yorick uh, has no demon other than his armor. So I, wa- I just imagine, you know, as we move forward, that uh, she might have that same role she play, uh, as his conscience. Mm-hmm. And companion. Mm-hmm. I could see yeah. that. I could see that. He's going to, you know, who is he going to connect to? You know, at this point, um, he's he's running next to, uh, is he running next to Farter Quorum um, when they leave town? Oh, right on the sledge. Yeah. Um, think, yeah. yeah, he's he's sort of right because you know, Lyra's sort of like wondering where he is and he's sort of yeah. loping next to them. Um, but, you know, I, 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 there seems he owes his debt to her. Mm-hmm. So she's going to be the one that he's going to be drawn to um, mm-hmm. and he's going to protect her and he's going to be with her. He's there for her. Uh, so I feel like that union is going to become stronger the more we read about them. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, did didn't Lee also know of her beforehand? Lee Scornsby knew yeah. of Lyra. Yeah. Didn't he, didn't he mention maybe that? Oh, is this the famous Lyra? Isn't isn't that wasn't that his line? I may I may have, I may, I may have be inventing it. that, but I I think you know there's another one where it's like you know just this Texan aeronaut who's been stranded because someone you know went back on a deal with him. He even knows who she is. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Yes, he does. He says, you must be the famous Lyra. How did you get on with Yurik Bernison? There you go. And they fought at the Tunguska campaign. He knew he was with he, Yurik, right? Yeah, he yes. knew Yurik. Yep. <sighs> so many good characters. I want to know about the Tunguska campaign now. Well, let's go back. This is like uh, Buda- it's like Budapest all over again. <laughs> <laughs> um so uh you guys want to wrap it up let's wrap it up let's yep. wrap it up um next week we'll talk about chapters 12 and 13 yes 12 and, 13. Um, and we'll uh the 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 title of the next chapter gives me the shivers so uh i'm a little nervous about reading on but i'm i'm also uh, uh excited and intrigued um uh, thank you guys for listening again. Um, I don't think we got any feedback, mm-hmm. but hopefully we will get some. You know what? Keep listening, man. Yeah. You don't have to ask any questions. We'll just keep t- – we'll, we'll listen. We can yammer on for an hour without any questions. So if you send us feedback, like, you guys are going to get two-hour-long podcasts, and nobody <laughs> wants that. Everybody wants that. I two want hour. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we, uh, I don't know if people knew this about us, but we record from three different places. Have we ever mentioned that where none of us are together? I guess people could assume that we're recording remotely, but we actually were in three different States. We're not even that close to each other. That's um, true. So it's been an adventure and I, I appreciate everyone cause we've been, um, um, you know, not all our, our sound quality is a, is a work in progress. Indeed. But this week, sound this quality is a good week. Chef's kiss Chef's again. Kiss. Ah. Chef's kiss. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so far, so good. And I appreciate uh, Joanna, your children not uh, playing Fortnite tonight. Yes. And Monopoly playing, all the Monopoly. way. Monopoly all the way. Not if even they, video. If they Monopoly. need a fix, I'll do a Fortnite dance on camera for them. <laughs> oh my God. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> um, so thanks for listening, everyone. Um, please uh, like and uh, and comment. 
or review if you choose. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. It helps us be more visible to other listeners. Um, and uh, still no date on the on the um, release of the show. We're anxiously awaiting. Comic-Con kind of let us down with that, although we did get some nice footage. But come on, man. What are we waiting for? Yeah, I was disappointed. I want to know. Date. That's all I need. It's, you know, it's... It's got to be the fall, right? It's got to be this fall. It's got to be this fall. It's in the can. It's no. done. I got to plan my life. I need to know. Yeah. I just need to know. I do need to know. Um, but uh, thank you again for listening and uh, feedback at uh, the Amber Spycast, amberspycast.com. Uh, the website is theamberspycast.com as well. We're on uh, Facebook and we're on Instagram and we're on Twitter, although we're not super busy on Instagram and Twitter yet, but we're working on that. Um, And uh, we really appreciate it, guys, for listening. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.